All right, let's look at the board. Let's look at the board. Where are we gonna go? Let's see. Zala Egerseg. That one's leaving. Already left. Too late. Let's just go with the first one that's gonna leave. Ah, okay. Sekesh Fehervar. A fantastically named place that used to be the seat of kings. Why not? Let's do it. 11.10. Tease parts. No watch. What can you do? Fairly empty on here today. Let's take a seat. And we shall get going. Welcome back, folks, to another episode of Walking with Willie. Sit back, relax, stay for a bit, stay for a while, stay for the whole damn thing. Whatever you do, have a good time. I'll have you know I've actually been to Sekish Fehervar twice before. Both times to go to one of the best bathhouses in all of Hungary. The Arpad Ferdu. Unfortunately closed right now. Oh, wow, look at this. Panama Shirazu. Ha ha. Oh, That's a nice little Shirazu. Well, today's adventure is not about bathhouses or Shirazus. It is about the Battle of Mohach, which has absolutely nothing to do with Sekesh Fehervar, to tell you the truth. Now, if you'll remember from last episode, we left off with the brutal execution of Doja Gyurgy. And the nobility did not stop there. The next half decade of Hungarian history, 1514 to around 1520, is really notable for the complete and total crackdown on the backs of the peasantry. And as we know, all of this was made possible by the weakness, by the impotence of Mashedek Ulaslo's leadership. But now in 1516, Mashedek Ulaslo Jagiello dies. He kicks the bucket. And who takes over? His 10-year-old son. A tiny little potato boy by the name of Lajos. This looks like a nice little place. Wunderbar street food. Wunderbar Wunderburger review. Igazabol Najontino. Yohai. Talan. Njotspont. Ketu. Now, Potato Louis, he's the second Louis to be the Hungarian king. The first Louis. Naj Lajos was one of the best kings that Hungary ever had. Tough act to follow, particularly for a 10 year old. And I'm not emphasizing Lajos, I'm not emphasizing his age so much to absolve him of any responsibility going forward. I just want to point out that the king of Hungary right now is 10 years old. But he's not the only young ruler in Europe. In fact, this decade between 1510 and 1520 is a transformative time for leadership amongst many of the great powers in the European sphere. Francis I of France. He comes into power 1515, 21 years old. 1516, our buddy Lajos, 10 years old. 1520, Emperor Charles V of Austria. He takes over leadership of the Holy Roman Empire. And also in 1520, a man who would one day come to be known as Suleiman el Magnifico. Suleiman the Magnificent. You may know him as Naj Suleiman. He takes control of the Ottoman Empire. And onwards we shall walk. Some nice yellows in Sekesh Fehervar. They did not save them all for Budapest. Look at this tree. Oof. That is a Game of Thrones looking tree. When Suleiman takes over in 1520, he's not magnificent yet. He's just plain old Suleiman. And his first intention is not to go start a ruckus up in Hungary. In fact, one of his first moves is to send a peace emissary to King Lajos in order to renew a truce that had been made between his father, Selim I, and Masha de Gulaslo. Not only is the peace emissary rebuffed, but Lajos, or Lajos's advisors, because we can't really put any of the decision making at the feet of Lajos himself at this point, Long story short, they capture the peace emissary, arrest him, a huge affront to Suleiman the Magnificent. Suleiman, he, he's none too happy about this development. This is an incredibly insulting, aggressive move to arrest a peace emissary. So what does Suleiman do? In 1521, Suleiman conquers Nandor Fehervar, the first significant notch on his soon to be magnificent belt. The Hungarian royal orb, a nice statue, silhouette against the blue skies. Oof. That's the ticket. It's hard to overestimate just how big of a blow this is to the Hungarian defenses. Already, Hungary is in a state of absolute turmoil. Economic depravity, 
complete instability, a lot of factional rivalry that has opened up in this power vacuum due to a weak, young, and impotent ruler. And so to lose the fortress at Nandor Fehervar, which was not only important from a strategic perspective, but also from an emotional, psychological perspective, the fortress at Nandor Fehervar was the defense, the defense against the Ottoman incursion. It was something that was celebrated throughout history as the place where Hunyadi Janos made his stand, an inconquerable fortress, and now it had fallen. We're walking down Fuutsa, AKA Main Street. You know, I'm a pretty big Sekish Fehervar guy. A lot of people, they say, oh, Sekish Fehervar. I like to say, Sekish Fehervar, Najan yo. So now Suleiman, he's conquered Nandor Fehervar and he comes back to the Ottoman Empire. He runs back to Istanbul, winter's approaching, and he has a lot of other priorities to take care of before he decides to set back out towards Europe because there's a Mameluk uprising in Egypt. He's got to quell that. We've got a Janissary uprising in Istanbul. He's got to quell that, of course. And we've got a couple of other little conflagurations around the Ottoman domains. The Ottoman Empire at this point is rapidly expanding in every direction. And one of his significant conquests is defeating the Knights of St. John, a last Christian holdout on the island of Rhodes off the coast of Greece. Zarva? Yeah. Sip Zene. Turvain has, I believe that is a courthouse. Najon Erikesh Temple. Before we get to 1525 and 1526 and the Battle of Mohach, let's rewind a bit and turn our attention back to some of the power dynamics that are unfolding in Europe at this time because they're very interesting, they're very complex, and they have a great deal of bearing on this story. Back in 1515, when Masha de Kulaslo was still running the shop, he solidified a double marriage pact that would have huge implications for the future of Hungarian history. And of course, in 1515, Lajos is only nine years old. He's not going to get married yet. But in 1521, the same year that the Ottomans conquered Nandor Fehervar, Lajos II of Hungary marries, well, Mary of Habsburg. Sekes Fehervar. Turvein hatoshaki pistoshaga as a nyotsas hit the nyots av Julius ho. Mary of Habsburg is the younger sister to Archduke Ferdinand of Austria, the next in line to the throne of the Holy Romans, and she's also the younger sister of Emperor Charles V, who becomes the Holy Roman Emperor in 1520, as we mentioned earlier. And so Lajos, he marries Mary, and Lajos's sister, Anne, she marries Archduke Ferdinand. And this fuses the Habsburgs and the Jagiellos into pretty much one big family. Now, as far as Suleiman is concerned, this is a fairly unconscionable act of aggression because Suleiman and the rest of the Ottoman Empire, their mortal enemy is the Habsburgs. Here we got Major Orsag, we got the Duna, the Danube, the Tisa. There this summer, you may remember, Lake Balaton, and here is good old Sekish Fehervar. Nice. It's the ninth biggest city in Hungary, would you believe it? The ninth biggest city in Hungary. Now another development that occurs which bears mentioning is that between 1521 and 1525, Emperor Charles and King Francis of France, they decide to test each other out in that age-old battleground known as Northern Italy. Emperor Charles, he gets the best of King Francis at the Battle of Pavia in 1525. And now Emperor Francis, he is held captive by the Holy Romans. And his mother, she sends an envoy down to the Ottomans and says, please help out my son, help out Francis. The Habsburgs are so mean, what can you do for me? Suleiman, what can you do for me, please? And Suleiman, he says, okay, let's form an alliance. I hate the fucking Habsburgs. And so they form an alliance. The French and the Ottomans. This is an alliance that would last for about 300 years. And it just gets kicking now. And the French, they say, Suleiman, go get revenge against the Habsburgs for us, please. Oh, I think we might have some stinky water over there. Stinkier and tastier than you ever could have hoped for. That's going to be an 8.3 for me. Njotspontharam. Look at these Sekish Fehervarian Kachak. 
So let's recap here. Suleiman, he's exposed the soft pink underbelly of the Carpathian Basin by conquering Nandar Fehervar. The Hungarians and the Habsburgs have formed an alliance via double marriages. And now, Suleiman has a raison d'être due to his alliance with the French and King Francis. So there's basically a three-pronged reason to go attack Europe once more. And as 1525 reaches its end and turns to 1526, Suleiman is galvanizing the troops, consolidating his base of power, and getting ready to strike back out towards the Hungarian heartland, towards Major Orsak. A very just ugly structure. I mean, I like it. I don't think many other people will. I like it because of the historical trends which it exposes. And it's fascinating, it's unusual, it's unique. But I'm really glad they don't make buildings like this anymore. I mean, what was going on in the communist era? It's like the opposite of taking drugs or just taking the wrong kind. Now, before we get to the battle itself, I think it's important just to elaborate a little bit on just how unprepared Hungary is at this moment for military action, for defense of its borders, and for a major conflict. You may remember a man by the name of Sapoyai Janos from our last episode about Doja Girj. And Sapoyai Janos, he's seen as a real Hungarian leader. He's the voivode of Transylvania, and unlike King Lajos, who has made his bed with the Habsburgs, Sapoyai Janos is seen as this sort of next generation of potential Hungarian leadership. Instead of relying on the Jagiellos and leaders from elsewhere, a lot of the Hungarian barons and nobility, they want a leader that is actually Hungarian. But this just shows you that as Suleiman is getting ready to launch his attack, we do not have a cohesive Hungarian state. We have a lot of factionalization, a lot of inner rivalry, a lot of back and forth, this, that, the other and a huge trend of decentralization of power, which has occurred from the end of the reign of King Matyas through the years of Masha de Kulaslo, and now has really exploded into quite a chaotic state in the early years of Laos's reign. All right, let's call a goose a chicken, cut to the chase, and get ready to follow Suleiman on his conquest through Major Orsag in the year 1526. And as spring approaches, Suleiman is galvanizing his troops and getting ready to launch the attack. His commander-in-chief is one of his most trusted advisors, a man by the name of Ibrahim Pasha. And about 70,000 troops roll out of town, roll out of Istanbul, making incredible hastes in the direction of Major Orsak. Look at how gracefully the light dances off of this salmon edifice. Okay. Hardo! Hardo coming through. Everybody back up. We've got a Hardo. We've got a live Hardo. Oh, maybe a little bit of potato. Who knew? Who knew? Honved Utsa. The Honved being the Hungarian military. And the Hungarian military was perhaps never as ill-prepared for a battle as they were in 1526. Luckily for them though, they had some time to catch their breath because the spring of 1526 in the direction of Hungary from Istanbul, there was dramatic, dramatic flooding that year. And so Ibrahim Pasha, Suleiman the Magnificent, and their 70,000 are so strong, they have a very hard time making the voyage. However, eventually they're able to make it to Nandor Fehervar and they regroup and get ready to spring forward. Lovag Kirai, Yo Kirai, Kedvins Bela, Negidik Bela, Persa, De Ishtetsi Karmadik Bela. Lova Kirai. In the end, Laos and his advisory council, they're able to cobble together a collection of troops. A lot of mercenaries, actually. We got mercenaries from all over Central Europe, the Czech lands, modern day Slovakia, a lot of mercenaries from the Germans, some Spanish mercenaries, in fact. Um, and this mercenary band, along with a lot of the barons and the nobles that are on the side, of King Laos, they come together and they get ready to make their brave defense down in the south of Hungary. So Suleiman and Pasha Ibrahim, they're gathering together the troops in Nandor Fehervar. Suleiman, he sends Pasha Ibrahim up north to a place called Petrovarad. 
and Ibrahim Pasha, he makes very short work of conquering that fortress of Petrovarad. I think the Ottomans only end up losing like 25 men. You have to remember that the Ottomans, they have a huge militaristic advantage at this point. The Ottoman Empire is at the cutting edge of military technology when it comes to cannons, when it comes to gunpowder, when it comes to pretty much everything. The commander-in-chief of King Laos's army is a man by the name of Tomori Pal, or as I like to call him, Pali the Priest Tomori. He's the Archbishop of Kolocha, and he's really just a warrior monk. He's a very brave man. He's a strong military commander, and he's supposed to provide the backbone of the Hungarian defense efforts. Alongside of Pali the Priest, you've got Sapoyai Janos's younger brother, Sapoyai Gij. Now, after conquering Petrovarad, Petevarad, Petro, Peter, Serbian, Hungarian, what are you gonna do? A lot of confusion. Oh, Hungarian flag. Okay, let's go with Peter Barad. Anyway, after conquering Peter Barad, Suleiman, he makes his way towards the towns of Uilak and Esek. And he captures those in no short time as well. And now the Ottomans, now the infidel, they strike out towards a place called Mohac. And they cross the Drava River. And Mohac, it's a plain, it's situated right between the Danube and the Drava. It's like a flat little pancake place. And... It's kind of perfect for a pitched battle if you're an invading force. Not so much if you're the defending force, particularly because the Ottomans, they make their camp outside of Mohac on a nice position. It's got a hill, it's got woods. The Hungarians, they're coming in and they just have the plane. Fish I love how a lot of the Hungarian suburban dwellings have a nice little vineyard, just enough vines to make some home pressed wine. Look at the light splashed up against the leaves, the pines, the needles. Oh yes, well, the stage is set for a story that is as dismal as this day is lovely. So we got Lajos, Tomori Pal, Pali the Priest, Sapoyai Jorj, and the rest of the Hungarians making their way down to Mohac. And we have Suleiman the Magnificent, Ibrahim Pasha, and all the Akinjis, Sipahis, Janissaries, Rumelians, Anatolians, and all those other difficult to pronounce Ottoman military leaders and ethnic groups storming their way up to Mohac. And they meet on the morning of August 29th. We're in Ureghej. Ureghej. The old hill. Nice little town. Najon Sukifalu. Ah, I think it's closed. I think it's closed the Borivar. Uh-oh. Well, this castle certainly would have been lovely to waltz around. But, as it is closed, it is just as good as a fitting place to regale you all with one of the most tragic events in Hungarian history. The Battle of Mohac. For as the forces met that morning on August the 29th, it was a completely mismatched set of armies. I mean, look, the Ottomans were 75,000 strong. They have incredibly sophisticated military technology. They've just had a series of successive victories. They seem like an unstoppable force. And the Hungarian side, on the other hand, you know, they, they don't have that much cohesion. They're brave soldiers and they really want to defend the homeland against the infidels, but they're led by a 20 year old, fairly impotent king. And they have just essentially a raggle taggle group of mercenaries. And led by Tomori Pal, the Hungarians make their charge. And they have some early success. The battle seems to be going in the Hungarians' favor. They actually vanquish one of the lines of troops of the Ottomans. However, as is usually the case with military engagements, the side with the numerical and tactical and technical superiority ends up making that superiority felt. Now the Hungarian ace in the hole was supposed to be the forces of Sapoyai Janos, the voivode of Transylvania. He has a group, I think over 10,000 men, and they're stationed over right now in Seged, but they never make it to Mohac in time. Partly because Lajos gives some confusing orders, he first tells Sapoyai Janos to go hook around and encounter the Ottomans down south at the border. And then he says, no, 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 we're fighting in Mohac, come to Mohac. Either way, long story short, Sapoyai Janos, he does not make it to Mohac. Ooh, <laughs> easy does it. After about two hours, the battle has already finished. And the Hungarians lie eviscerated on the battlefield. 
There's 25,000 Hungarian troops at the battle. I think about 18, 19, 20,000 end up dying. 500 nobles die. I think 50 barons. And King Lajos himself, King Lajos himself, he ends up drowning in a nearby creek, thrown from his horse and sunk to the bottom due to his heavy armor. And the 20 year old king who had led Hungary for 10 years into this disaster at Mohac is now dead. Now Suleiman, he knows this isn't all the Hungarians and he's still waiting for these further armies of Sapoyai Janos, for example, to come with reinforcements. But after a day, he realizes they're not coming. He beheads a lot more of the Hungarian prisoners and makes his way up the Danube towards a now undefended Budapest. Of course, it's not Budapest yet. It's just Buda and Pest. A lot of the remaining nobles have already tucked their tails between their legs and made their way out of the city to Pozsony, modern-day Bratislava, another hugely important Hungarian capital. But what remains is taken by the Ottomans. They wreck Budapest, they leave it in ruins, they burn it down, and they make their way back down the Danube towards Istanbul with a huge, hefty, smorgasbord of plunder. Sapoyai Yano, she's waiting down in Seged, and he probably could have engaged the Ottomans. It might have been a disastrous decision, but he probably could have made some sort of defense against them. But he decides to play it safe because Sapoyai Yano, she already has his eyes set on what's gonna happen next. Remember, the Habsburgs secured their own line of succession to the Hungarian throne with this double marriage alliance. Okay, okay. I don't like the Habsburgs either. I don't like the Habsburgs either. So the Archduke Ferdinand, Emperor Charles' younger brother, who's of course married to the now dead Laios' sister Anne, he wants the throne. It was supposed to be his, according to the Yagiello marriage contract, but of course Sapoyai Janos has different ideas about that. He's a Hungarian king, and he thinks he deserves the throne. And so he's saving his military not to fight the Ottomans, but instead to probably fight the Habsburgs in what's soon to inevitably be a civil war. After the Ottomans finally make it out of Hungary and back down to Istanbul, two competing coronations occur. One of Sapoyai Janos, now Kirai Janos, King John, and the other one of the Archduke Ferdinand. And Sapoyai Janos, his coronation, it happens right here in Sekish Fehervar. The city of kings. Anyway, we'll get to the Hungarian Civil War, another episode. Don't need to make a meal of it. There's two competing coronations and chaos ensues. But first, let's reflect a little bit on this terrible disaster in Mohac because it really was the end of an era in Hungary. It was the end of the, the era of medieval kings. Now, the Hungarian realm, it limped along for a further 15 years until the ultimate capitulation under the Ottomans and the division of the country into three spheres. But this was the psychological scar, the psychological wound that really did the Hungarians in. There's all sorts of different debates, as you can imagine, for who deserves the blame for the disaster of Mohac. A lot of people actually, they blame Sapoyai Janos. They say he never came to reinforce. A lot of people blame Lajos. They say that he was a terrible king. Hard to disagree with that. But again, he was so young. A lot of people blame the factionalization of the nobility. A lot of people give a great deal of credit to the military sophistication of the Ottomans and the leadership of Suleiman the Magnificent. All right, folks, it's time for us to make our way back to Budapest. I'm late for the train, back to the big city. Loved our day out in Sekish Fehervar. Tragic story about the Battle of Mohac but a hugely, hugely, hugely important story. I hope that you took something out of it. I hope that you had fun. I hope that you enjoyed yourself. We shall be back very, 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 very soon with much more from Walking with Willie. Kusunum Seipen, Eish Seip Napot. All right, we've got a little bit of an emergency unicum cave, coffee unicum, unicum barista, train track sunset review. Never seen this before, brand new. Gonna have to give it a little try. Let's see how we do. Let's see how we do, Unicum. I'm a big Unicum guy. Not sure how I'm gonna like the coffee, but I like coffee. I like Unicum. It smells all right. Mm. 
weird. Not bad. Kind of good. 6.8. To be totally honest with you. I actually kind of love it. <laughs> You guys are the best. Thank you so much for making it through. Tell your friends, subscribe, do the rest, and we shall see you next week.